Okay, I, I have to use my glasses so I can hardly see you guys. So. Um, the, uh, I find it difficult to talk about what to say terrorism in, in the Sahel. Not that there are, not, there are no terrorists there, but because the, the threat is multifaceted, is a result of a uh, confluence of myriad hostile forces uh, sponsoring state, ethno-national elements, jihadists, and organized crime. They all come together, they all reinforce each other, they all contribute to each other's activities, and therefore it is impossible to say, okay, this is Al-Qaeda, which is again, it's a misnomer, and here and some liberation movement start there. No, it's, it's one big epidemic. Uh, the other problem that exists is that the local states, well-intentioned as they may be, are uh, fairly dysfunctional and crisis management capabilities of local states leave a lot to be desired and therefore uh, problems that could have been managed and resolved rather simply are just being blown out of proportion because of mismanagement by the local forces. Uh, I think that one of the things that the West can and should do is help with crisis management. Threat analysis and crisis management is not intelligent or training people to run around with Kalashnikov or M16 or whatever it is. It's a little bit more complicated. Now, we cannot ignore the Sahel or the whole of West Africa. We, we need to look at one big block from the Red Sea to the Atlantic to the Mediterranean to the Gulf of Guinea. It's one big block that, that cannot be really separated. Um, Western Europe, especially the southern part of Western Europe, like here, is exposed to it. These guys are going to swing the Mediterranean up north, whether you like it or not. So, if it is possible to contain and resolve the problem in Africa, then they won't swing. If the crisis is allowed to continue and fester, hey guy, watch your shores. Simple. Um, sorry for being cynical, but, but that's where we are today. Um, the second thing is West Africa, again, I'm using it as a kind of uh, simplistic term, is super rich. The amount of natural resources that exist in that part of the world is unbelievable, and world economy needs it. So, especially the industrialized West, you cannot, we cannot do a lot of the high-tech industry without the rare minerals that exist there. The uranium is important, the oil and gas and so on and so forth are important. So the West has to extract them. The West has to get them into its own economy. Other alternative Chinese and other not so nice guys will get it with the complicated life of the West in more than one way. So we cannot ignore that region for that reason on, uh, also. Okay, so it gets me to the point that uh, okay, who are the bad guys that we have to tackle to deal with? And then I'll talk a little bit about how we're going to do it. Number one are the state sponsors. Because, look, if I give you a simple example, I mean, these are the stupid things that are not stupid, but the, 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 the down to earth things that, that, we used, that I used to do back in government. Okay, we have clashes from the Mauritania on the way to Belgium. Most people are using Kalachnikovs, okay? Shooting. Where does the ammunition come from? Has anybody asked that question? More than three quarters of the ammunition is made in Iran. We're talking Libya, but no, that the number one source of ammunition that's being fired at the good guys is coming from Iran to Sudan and from Sudan going westward. The Libyan, Libyan contributed some quality weaponry, but more people are being killed with Kalashnikov than with some sophisticated RPGs. So sponsoring state who want to prevent the West from consolidating presence in the region are our number one problem. And uh, that problem has become significantly worse 
on 17 June this year, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, when the Sudanese and the Iranian convened the, convened the summit in Khartoum and started talking about reaching all the way to Mauritania, a new way of supplies, terrorism, sponsorship, and so on and so forth. Again, we call, we we'll list all of the Al Qaeda's and the Ansars and the what have you, but without the sponsoring state, these guys would be starved. Because even if they have a lot of money from say, drug trafficking, you, you cannot go to the supermarket and say, give me a million bullets. You still need the sponsoring state to deliver it. Okay, so that's issue number one. Um, and we, we normally tend to say, oh, that you know, non, non state uh, actors and so on and so forth. No, they need to be sponsored. Issue number two is the spread of wherewithal and expertise from failed states. Uh, I'm far more worried about people who served in the Libyan armed forces, people who served in the Algerian armed forces, people who served in the Egyptian armed forces, increasingly people from northern Nigeria who served in the Nigerian armed forces who are gravitating into the heart of the Sahel because these people bring with them know-how. There's a hell of a difference between 1,000 armed men and 1,000 men armed. And the, we can see a developing and evolving quality to the performance of the various uh, terrorist elements and again, from criminality all the way to jihadism. We see an evolving quality. And which means that the armed forces, the, the, the state authority, the West, will have to tackle far, far more sophisticated group. The communication is better, the use of, of uh, tactical, of the various uh, 4x4s or all terrain trucks with weaponry on them is becoming better. They cover each other, the spread, etc. It's no longer a single helicopter can come and just break the whole convoy and, and be done with it. Now it takes all the information, we've got the cover, they shoot down, the French learned about it when they lost the, their uh, gazelle at the beginning because there was an ambush, there was flank protection. First time. Okay. Organized crime. Organized crime is extremely important, and, and I'm going to go out of importance, because it brings money. These movements are well funded. Yeah, the West helps also by paying for ransom for the various kidnapped guys, but the amount of money that comes from Latin America, the amount of money that comes from China and other producers of uh, illicit cigarettes, the amount of money that comes from organized crime from, uh, for smuggling their own uh, shooters into Western Europe across up north, is immense. And as a result of it, these movements have money. And with money you can buy a lot of things, like brand new Japanese trucks, rather than the 15, 20 years old that came from Chad that with which they started the, the revolt. Nothing. We don't do anything about it. We cannot control. We don't control the runway that they're using. And they lost so far only one Boeing 727. And they're running now Boeing 747. From Colombia or from Venezuela all the way to, to Mali, Niger, etc. And there's nothing we can do about it. Fun. Fun stuff, guys. Okay, now we get to the jihadists. Okay, I don't like the word Akin, the Al Qaeda of the Islamic language. Because it's, it is not it. Okay, because in our bit is the Al Qaeda jihad field which means the foundation, the basis of jihad in the Islamic Maghreb, which by the way includes also Spain, I mean the area that is uncontrolled in Western Europe. Um, <coughs> it, it is a theological guidance. It is, it, it is a general framework. What's important is what happens inside. Because, because these are the guys that at the end of the day do the shooting and blow up things. So, we have Variety of Qaeda, so-called Qaeda, I don't call them, um, 
subgroups are Kitai, Batali. Some of them are more involved in drug trafficking, some of them are more involved in actual jihadism. They, their ideology, ideological character of the various commanders varied from one to another. National identity, tribal grouping, uh, ethnocentric relationship, and so on and so forth vary. They're not unique. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're not monolithic. They, the change, they evolve, they make alliances, and they fight with each other. They make alliances and they fight with each other. Um, and therefore, if there's no one solution to it all. You have to really go one, 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 and, and study them in great detail, each and every group of 300 or whatever. For the West, it's a nightmare, but there's no other solution. Furthermore, uh, I, I, I will try to do it really quickly. Um, starting 2004-05, the fall of 2004-2005, the jihadist <coughs> movement, I'll call it Al-Qaeda, which is really misnomer, has been evolving. The, the, the original generation of founding fathers that were really monolithic because they served together in Afghanistan, served together in Sudan, a change. And we came a whole new generation that are more ethnocentric, <coughs> that are more localized, that they are kept in. And in the Middle East, we saw the beginning with the relationship between uh, Zakawi, Abu Musa and Zakawi, and, and Zawahiri, etc., as a correspondent. Today, starting 2007, 2008, and especially recently, more recently, that trend has reached the Sahel. And, and we, we, we just discovered, I don't know if uh, you're familiar with, very interesting correspondence between Al-Qaeda Central in Pakistan and uh, Mukhtar, the, the commander of one of the Vicky type of, of the Akim, so-called Akim. <coughs> they tell him, hey, we send you money, we demand this, we demand that, and he says, and, and his response is essentially, go to hell, I'm the boss here. Yeah, it follows the, the theological guidance, the theological outlines, and so on and so forth, but when it comes to really running the show, I'm the boss guy. Take a hike. Or actually, words are even worse, I was the best, but we have a lady present. Um, this is an issue that we need to learn how to cope with again, because Knowing what al qaeda Central is saying is not enough in order to understand what's happening on the ground. And, and this is a complex issue. Finally, we have the variety of ethnocentric or ethno-national groups. Liberation, so-called liberation movements that believe that they deserve one kind of, be it statehood or what have you, that pursue progression whatever political agendas. Uh, the Tuaregs are the most notorious, but again, the Tuaregs are part of this monolithic. Um, and there are others. I'm sorry, but not every three guys who want to have their own state with the flag <coughs> can have their own state with the flag. Uh, it's not so much an issue of people wanting to have a state or people believing that they deserve to have a state. It is people are people capable of having the state. Is it possible to take a chunk of real estate and call it whatever, the new Mukmuk uh, Islands, and boom, they can function? No, they cannot. The, the, the states, they are dysfunctional, and if you start carving them to things that have no economic foundation, no popular foundation, no, uh, no infrastructure, and so on and so forth, in this, despite anybody's uh, good intentions uh, and desires and aspiration, no, it's not going to work. And we should, for as long as, as Africa depends on Western assistance, Western help, Western expertise, and so on and so forth, they should listen. Uh, they, they, they need not create problems that then become unsolvable. Sorry, guys. Okay, so, solution. Um, I'm trying to put some up. Just killing the dead guys. Well, we need to kill a lot of them. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not vegetarian. Uh, but 
change is not enough because if you if the the um, motivation, the needs, the aspirations remain the same, then there'll be a lot of guys come eager to to fill in the shoes. In in the culture of martyrdom, hey, to help a good idea to go with the bank and there'll be five guys running to, to fill in the shoes and go with bigger bank. We don't want it. So yeah, we need to kill the current guys because if you don't kill them, they'll kill us. It, it, you know, it's kind of a simple military idea. Um, but at the same time, we need to diffuse the motivation so that the second generation will go play soccer rather than go explore. The key is, and this is, I think, the big cardinal sin of the West. The key is that we need to look and listen to the local people. I've, I've alluded to, we are dealing with an extremely complex, fractured, convoluted region where the traditions are based on, on, on tribal, on nationality, on heritage, on religion, on grievances of one kind or another, real, imaginary, whatever that they believe in. You know, I, I've, I've had scholars, good scholars, telling me look, that um, it was something in, in Nigeria, Niger, that, that the grievance had nothing to do with reality. Then they brought all of the French documents of the colonial era to show that we, the incidents in question never happened. Okay, fine, I believe them. No problem. Yeah, in 1870-something, the French did not kill whoever they, the, they accused of killing. Fine. But there are tens of thousands of people eager to die and kill in revenge for that incident. And they're not going to listen to me or to you or to anybody else telling them that the documents in the archive somewhere in near, the, near the side that show that it never happened. So we have to deal with it. And we have to deal with similar issues of one kind or another. So, we have major issues of urbanization on top of everything. We have major issues of lack of skills in running states, not just security. All of these need to be resolved. Which brings, which, uh, okay. um, which means we need to approach Africa bottom up. Start with good governance at the local level. Address the issues of quest for self-determination, but quest for self-determination within existing states. Uh, I'll use Mali as an example. Mali is a complex state. Okay, if you look at the map, the straight lines that some French cartographer drew, I mean, they're ridiculous. They don't exist. But Mali has a unique issue. On the one hand, Mali was an empire. Timbuktu was a center of culture. But Timbuktu right now is in a marginalized northern area that is essentially empty. The economic, social, governance heartland of Mali is in the southern area. You, you, you cannot resolve it, okay? You cannot resolve these uh, that caught me just by talking nicely or by sending a thousand old French guys to run around and shoot at everything that moves. It, it not, ain't gonna work. But there is a solution. It's called autonomy. Give autonomy to what the, the rebels call as a what? Enable them to run their lives as they see fit. Enable them to pursue the heritage, the tradition, the importance of people to the importance of, of what they used to be, and at the same time, they are part of a larger money where the gravitas, the economic and governance and so on, gravitas is in the populated area. There are solutions, but we need to do it. We cannot just pick up a phone and call government of money and say, do it, and we're sending you a check or we're sending you three bombers. No. We need to do it on the ground, tribe by tribe, village by village, and so on and so forth. Only when it is built bottom up and in realistic capability, then we will be able to defeat the jihadists and so on and so forth, right now prey on the vulnerability of the state. <coughs> because all of these movements live from the fact that there is a dysfunctional 
matrix. The function of the matrix.